I'm, I'm going to read from, to you from the message version of the Bible. Um, so those of you who are following in your uh, Romans booklet, you might find it slightly different, but um, it's just a different way of saying the same thing. So I'm going to just um, read a little bit um, from the beginning of Romans 9 to start with. I'm going to read verses 1 to 5 just to put what Christopher is going to talk about in, in context so we know um, a little bit about where um, it's coming from. So, verses 1 to 5. At the same time, you need to know that I carry with me at all times a huge sorrow. This is, this is Paul speaking. It's an enormous pain deep within me and I'm never free of it. I'm not exaggerating. Christ and the Holy Spirit are my witnesses. It's the Israelites. If there were any way I could be cursed by the Messiah so that they could be blessed by him, I'd do it in a minute. They're my family. I grew up with them. They had everything going for them. Family, glory, covenants, relationships, worship, promises. To say nothing of being the race that produced the Messiah, the Christ, who is God over everything, always, yes. So we're now going to move on to verses 30 to 33 at the end of Romans chapter 9. How can we sum this up? All those people who didn't seem interested in what God was doing actually embraced what God was doing as he straightened out their lives. And Israel, who seemed so interested in reading and talking about what God was doing, well, they missed it. How could they miss it? Because instead of trusting God, they took over. They were absorbed in what they were doing. They themselves were doing. They were so absorbed in their God project that they didn't notice God right in front of them, like a huge rock in the middle of the road. And so they stumbled into him and went sprawling. Isaiah, again, gives us the metaphor for pulling this together. He says, careful, I've put a huge stone on the road to Mount Zion a stone you can't get round, but the stone is me. If you're looking for me, says God, you'll find me on the way, not in the way. Thanks very much, Anne. And good morning, everybody. Let's have, um, if we can, the first of my um, slides. We're continuing with a series on Romans. Romans is a book in the New Testament and it's called Romans because it was a letter written by Paul to um, a young church in Rome. And uh, we're in, um, I think, a relatively uh, difficult section of Romans over the next few weeks, as, as indeed we were last week. Um, um, it is, though, uh, can we go back to the first slide? It is, though, um, I want to pick up on something that Nick said last week. He says it really is all about Jesus. And I think that is absolutely right. That is fundamentally um, the message. But um, what I've got to say this morning does come with quite a big health warning. You know, if you kind of come to church this morning or you're tuned in on Zoom and you're kind of looking for a sermon that would kind of leave you with a warm feeling at the end, but without really engaging your mind, then you've picked the wrong church. And in fact, as you picked the wrong religion, because Jesus said that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind. Um, but, but some of the things I'm going, the questions I'm going to raise today are, are difficult. And there's a real danger that I'm going to say things that some people won't agree with, or even leave you with more questions at the end than you had when you came in. And um, 
Well, I, all I can say is I can't duck the challenge, I think, that's posed by uh, these chapters. So, so let's have the next slide, please. What on earth is going on here? Um, a few years ago, Anne and I were visiting Glasgow to see our son. And um, on the Sunday morning, we went to his church in Glasgow. And it was a, a quite a large church, but quite a traditional church. It had been there for many years. And it so happened that on the Sunday we were there, they were kind of welcoming new members to be part of the church. And uh, they did that by getting people up to the front to kind of say hello. And uh, the first uh, few people who kind of came to the front were kind of what you might expect, I guess, um, mature Christians who were kind of moving back into the area and, and, and choosing to join the church, people who were kind of British and had been Christians for, for many years. But then there was, a, there was another group, a much larger group, actually, um, which was mainly young men aged between 20 and 40. And they were all Iranians, and about one in three of them, I think, was, was that a first name of Muhammad. So these were Iranian Muslims who had turned to Christ and accepted Jesus and been welcomed into the church there. And I was completely uh, blown away by this. I never would have thought in my entire life I'd be sitting in a traditional church in Glasgow seeing such a large number of, of young Iranian Muslims who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And it was wonderful. But I guess it would also be... Um, a little bit of sadness, you think, you know, in a country where the churches were once very full, you know, there were no young Glaswegians that day joining the church. And, you know, uh, and, and, and there's a sadness about that. And, and, and we see that in, in our country as well. And Paul would have um, understood this situation completely because this is the situation that led him to write what we now call chapters 9, 10, 11 of Romans. It was all about the fact that, yes, there was tremendous good news. A lot of people were turning to Jesus and getting saved. But they were some of the last people you would have expected. Yeah. And the people you thought kind of ought to have got saved, the people who have been kind of Jews for generations, there's a trickle of them coming, but it's only a little trickle. So that is the issue that Paul is writing about. That's what Romans 9, 10, 11 is all about, really. Let's have the next slide. So, so some people become Christians. I'm going to say some people become Christians and stay Christians. And others never become Christians or, you know, they dip their toes in the water and, but then give up. Why is that? And uh, we probably have to say that, you know, that does cut across all countries. Uh, some countries have occasionally thought they were Christian countries. I think they were kidding themselves. But you know, it cuts across all countries, all cultures, all kind of social backgrounds. Um, but there's this issue about why you know, some people turn to Christ, and it's sometimes very often, and some of you may be sitting here today thinking, well, I'm in that category. You would never have thought of them becoming a Christian. Perhaps you never thought you would become a Christian, but it happened to you. Um, and sometimes the people you think, my goodness, you know, they were brought up in a Christian home, whatever it was, and they've not become Christians. And, and so this is, a, this is an issue. And, and, and why is that? And, and this isn't just a kind of intellectual question. You know, Paul, in the first verses that I read, you could feel his pain that his own people, uh, his Jewish people, were so few of them were coming through to faith in Jesus. Um, and, 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 you know, many of us have feel that pain about loved ones who, uh, you know, are not there. Um, but there's also a kind of theological aspect to this. You know, just a little while earlier in Romans 8, Paul had said, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Well, there's a whole lot of Jews who don't seem particularly tied into the love of God. What, what's going on here really is the question. So um, let's have the next slide and tackle some of uh, these quite difficult questions. Why does somebody become a Christian? And I'm, I've got, given you three options. We'll talk about the options and maybe some alternatives. Well, is it just chance or circumstances? Is, it, is there something about them? Or is it, is it fundamentally something that, that God, is, God is doing here? Um, well, the first uh, option, you know, chance or circumstances, um, I think that would be the one that most people who are not Christians would give. If there is no God, 
then you have to kind of explain why some people become Christians without referring to God. And they would say, well, it's down to sociology or psychology or background or an accident. Um, now, that's emphatically not what the Bible teaches. And actually, it makes no sense if there is a God. It, it's only an explanation that is really kind of useful or helpful if, if there is no God. So, so, so let's park that one. Um, number two, is it something about the person that makes them become a Christian? You know, you could say, uh, listen, if Christianity is true, then Christians must be a bit cleverer than other people because we've spotted something that other people have missed. Or maybe there's some kind of, you know, something within you that kind of predisposes you to want to become a Christian. Like, you know, and, and I'm neither of these things, but if, you, if you're musical or artistic, for example, you have an ability that somebody else doesn't have. Is it something in your heart? Is there something you're kind of born with latent in you that kind of leads you to, to accept God? Well, I, none of that is, is terribly convincing. And, and at the beginning of uh, Corinthians, Paul rubbishes some of that as well. And, and it, again, it's not what the Bible teaches. So uh, we're left with the third option, which is that the reason that someone becomes a Christian is that God is up to something in their life. The reason somebody becomes a Christian is God is up to something in their life. Now, you might be listening to think, hold on a second, Chris. You kind of pick those options. It, you know, I, I can think of other options. Surely, the reason someone becomes a Christian is that they've chosen to follow Jesus. Well, uh, that, that is true, by the way. But then I say, well, but where does that choice come from? What was, it, what was the kind of thing that led to them making that choice? And if you say, well, it was something within them, well, that's option two. If you say, well, the, the, the reason they made that choice was something of a gift they were given, well, that's option three. So actually, although that's true, it doesn't add to the options. And similarly, you might say, well, it's faith. You know, somebody becomes a Christian when they put their trust in God. That is true. But again, I'm going to say, so where does their faith come from? If it comes from inside, then it's, we're still in option two. If that faith is, in a sense, a gift given them to, by God, then we're kind of in option three, that God calls them. So uh, let's have the next slide. I'm kind of feeling the pressure these days. I can't do a talk <laughs> without, without referencing C.S. Lewis. So um, C.S. Lewis said, uh, no one can come to God unless God sends for them. And that is, that is this thought that God is up to something in our lives that leads us to God. Yeah. Actually, um, uh, C.S. Lewis developed some of the things we've been thinking about in one of his children's books. So it's one of the Narnia Chronicles. And it's a book called The Silver Chair. And it's a, it's a kind of fantasy, um, for those of you not familiar with the, the, the Narnia stories. And at the beginning of the story, two children are being pursued by school bullies. And um, one of them says, what we need to do is we need to call out for help. And we're going to call out to Aslan, who's a lion, but also a kind of Christ-like figure. We're going to call out to Aslan for help. And so they decide that they're going to do that. And three times they call out to Aslan for help. Well, they find themselves in a new world, in the world of Narnia. So they are rescued. And uh, one of the children later f finds himself in conversation with Aslan the lion. And um, they're having a short conversation. And the lion says something about, um, I, you know, I called you here. And uh, the child, a little girl, says, uh, I, I think there's been a mistake, she says. Um, you know, um, no one called us. We were the ones who did the calling. And of course, from her point of view, that's exactly right. You know, we were the ones who did the calling. And uh, the lion just says simply, um, you would not have been calling to me unless I had been calling to you. Now, um, believe me, there are, some, there are some very dull books written for adults that, you, that take a lot more words to say what Lewis said much less clearly. You would not have been calling to me unless I had been calling to you. So it's true that, that no one can come to God unless God sends for them, unless he's up to something in their life. Next slide. But let's look at the other side of this. Why does somebody never become a Christian? Or, or maybe they've kind of dipped the toe in the water of Christianity, but, but it's not continued. Why, why does somebody not become a Christian? 
And again, I put the choice up. Well, either, you know, in a sense, um, well, no one's responsible. It's just chance or circumstances. Or, you know, the person's responsible, the, the individual is responsible. Or um, God is responsible. Um, let's look at the first one first. I, I, think, I think the first thing to say that the first one, I think it's quite insulting to, to human beings. Um, you know, to say that it was all chance or, or happenstance. And I think, you know, no kind of uh, self-respecting atheist or Muslim would be, would be happy with number one as being, a, a, as being the answer. And again, I think it, it really doesn't make um, sense and it's not what the Bible teaches. You might think, well, you know, Chris, Chris, I heard what you said before. Clearly, the answer is going to be number three. It's, it's God's responsible when somebody doesn't become a Christian. Um, but let me say clearly that number three is not the right answer. And, you know, consistently in the Bible, and very clearly in the verses we're looking at today, the Bible teaches that people are responsible when they say no to God, that they are responsible for that decision. It is their decision. And, and actually, um, you know, I think most kind of self-respecting atheists or Muslims or, or, or Hindus or whatever would want to say, yeah, well, that's right. I, I kind of am responsible. I've got a, a good friend who's, a, who's an atheist, and um, um, he's probably too polite to say this, but I know it's what he thinks. He thinks very clearly. The reason I'm not a Christian is because it's a load of nonsense. So, you know, he's, he's made that decision. He's made that choice. Now, you might say, well, hold on a second. I know some people who have, you know, they would say, well, I'm not an atheist. Um, it's just that um, I'm not a Christian either. I'm just kind of keeping my options open. <laughs> um, but the thing about that is, you know, deciding not to decide is still a decision. Deciding not to decide is still a decision. And, and that's still really in, in number two, that, that they are responsible for that decision. So let's have a, the next slide and start to maybe pull some of this together. And, and you'll notice that there's, there's a kind of different answer to this. <laughs> if your final destination is heaven, you have only God to thank for it. But if your final destination is hell, you have got there by yourself. Now, um, some people are... are, are I think that's, that must be a contradiction, you know. If God is responsible for saving some people, then the rest can't be responsible for, for not having made that decision. Um, I think there's two answers for that. By far the best answer is actually the simple one that says, um, well, that's what the Bible teaches. And even though we might find it perplexing at times, that is God's word to us, and we have that on good authority. Um, but I would say, I think, and this is my kind of second reason, and this is not as, anything like as important as the first reason, but I, I, I'm not sure about the logic of that. Imagine that um, you know, one day you're driving your car, and you've been driving too fast, and you get done for speeding. And it so happens that a, a number of people got done for speeding by that same camera that day. And, um, and so you get, you get fined, and you get points put on your license. And, you know, later on, you hear that somebody who got caught has been pardoned. And well, you might be annoyed about that, but does that mean that you weren't yourself guilty of exceeding the speeding limit? I don't think it does mean that. Anyway, if that's not helpful to you, then dismiss it. <laughs> um, I'm afraid the difficult questions don't stop there. I've got another one for you. Let's, let's move on. Is there any point in praying for somebody to become a Christian? Hands up if you think the answer to that is yes. I think oh, that, that, that's, that's a clear majority. Um, and I think that absolutely is the right answer, by the way. I, I emphatically say we ought to pray for people to come to faith in Jesus Christ. I think that's right. But there are a couple of ways of thinking about these issues that may undermine our confidence to pray and I want to kind of get into those a little bit now. So let's have, the next, let's have the next slide. And this is a way of thinking that says, um, God is for you and the devil's against you, but the final decision is yours. And um, 
you know, just thinking about this a bit, I think you can see how that might undermine confidence in prayer. Because actually, it's not, you know, God could very well say, well, I've done my bit. It's up to them now. You know, I, I, I've kind of, you know, it's out of my hands now. Uh, so it could kind of sap our confidence in praying if we think like this. I think uh, something that's wrong with this, though, is the kind of the whole way in which it's thinking about God, the devil, and human beings. Because that's kind of God and the devil is equal and opposite. And uh, human beings is kind of almost the judge, you know, weighing the evidence from both and, and, and making a call. Um, the Bible never thinks about things like that. You know, God is way above the devil. And, uh, and he's way above us. So, um, although there may be kind of some truth in this, it can't be the whole picture. Can't be the whole picture. It, it's not kind of, uh, it's, it's not helpful in terms of prayer, but more than that, it, it just, that, that doesn't kind of feel right as an explanation. It's not the way the Bible thinks about these things. And, and you know, God is always powerful. There is no situation that God can do nothing about. Next one. And this you might think of as being kind of the, the other side of that. Um, God decided before the world began who will be saved, and his decision is unchangeable. Again, a yeah, kernel of truth in there, maybe. But you can see how that might um, undermine your confidence to pray. Because actually, if it's, if it's all sorted already, then, then what's the point in praying? In fact, actually, what's the point in doing anything if it's all sorted beforehand? And, um, and, and I'm not making this stuff up. You know, <laughs> Christians have thought like this from time to time. So, for example, in the 1700s, uh, a young newly ordained Baptist minister stood up in a meeting of other Baptist ministers and, set, uh, and, and put forward the case for overseas mission. And um, he was interrupted. A senior uh, Baptist minister got up and said, sit down, young man. If God wants to save the heathen, heathen he can do it without, any, without consulting you or me. Um, well, well, happily, the young man paid no attention. His name was William Carey, and he went on to be one of the great pioneers of, of mission to, 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 to India. Um, so put like that, that's, again, that, that there may be a kernel of truth, but it's not... It's not helpful, but it's certainly not the whole truth. I think, I think part of the way, what's wrong with that is the way it thinks about God in relation to time. Let me, let me just take a minute or two to explain this. Um, for us, you can think of time as a line. So, you know, um, I, I wake up or something at, at first thing in the morning, and then my day moves like this, doesn't it? And, and it, we get to midnight, and then it's another day. So, so time is like a line. And let's see, it's 11.20 now. I'm up maybe kind of halfway through. 11.20. But I occupy this point. And there's nothing I can do. I can't go back. Think, well, I wish I'd had a cup of tea this morning for breakfast instead of coffee. I can't, I can't go back and change that now. I can't move that way. And though I, although that bit is coming closer to me, it's coming at a rate of 60 minutes an hour. I can't speed that up or slow it down. I, I can't jump ahead and do something. So I am kind of within time. But, but most people think that God is not within time. So therefore, all moments are now and the present to God. So actually, you know, a decision that we might be praying about today, we might think, well, I'm praying about this today, might well be, it's still now to God before the world began. Now, I know that takes a bit of thinking about, but it's probably quite um, helpful and true. In fact, I had an experience of many years ago in prayer that, that illustrates some of this to me. I was, it was a, a, quite an unusual thing, but I was, at the time, I was working in a Christian center in Israel, um, and uh, one night in the kind of evening uh, kind of servicey devotional thing, I felt um, that I ought to pray for my friend Daniel, who wasn't a Christian, that he would come to that center. And, um, and it was quite a strong urge. And I remember at first I kind of wanted, well, I think, well, you know, I was kind of expecting him to come in a few days' time. And I thought, well, I, you know, I, I kind of know. Anyway, I felt this urge to pray. And the strange thing was, as I started to say the prayer, 
it came out a lot more enthusiastically than I was expecting. <laughs> and um, anyway, the service went on for a bit. And at some point, I, I, I'm sitting somewhere near the front. I, I turned around and looked behind me. And there was Daniel sitting on the back seat. And I was, I was blown away. Blown away by that. But, you know, thinking about that, is, I mean, it would have been half a day's journey for Daniel to get there from, from the kibbutz where he was working. And he must have been kind of walking up the path when I prayed that prayer. Does that mean that my prayer was completely redundant because God had already decided it? No, I think actually, you know, God often calls us to pray because he wants to involve us in something he's doing. And our prayer becomes one of the materials that he uses to make decisions. And, and, and so we can and should pray um, with confidence. Next, um, next slide. And I am getting kind of more back into the passage. So, so why didn't more Jews accept Jesus? Well, Paul, I guess, gives, he says three things about this, really. I think the first thing he says is, actually, this whole thing that's happened, Jesus coming, um, his crucifixion and his resurrection, the great uh, influx of pagans to become Christians, and the relatively small trickle of Jews, God's promise has not failed. This was actually all part of God's plan all along. Secondly, he says, you know, that, that those pagans who become Christians on the basis of faith are every bit as much part of uh, my people as, as, as those who have got a kind of long history of faith. And it'd be true to say, you know, I think of those Iranian Muslims that I saw come to the front, you know, it, 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 by accepting Jesus, by putting their faith in them, they become every bit as much Christians as somebody who's been a Christian and a member of the church for 60 years and whose parents and grandparents before them were Christians. So the entry point to God's people is, is always through faith. And, and thirdly, he says that you know, the Jews stumbled into Jesus. They got this wrong. And they did that because they were focusing on their performance of the law to save them. And the law was never intended to work that way. And so they stumbled into Jesus and and tripped over and went sprawling. And they were responsible for that. It was their responsibility that they made those choices. Next one. And here we're, we're getting back into the verses. Again, I'm sticking with the message because I, I, in this occasion I really like it. They were so absorbed in their God projects that they didn't notice God right in front of them like a huge rock in the middle of the road. And so they stumbled into him and went sprawling. I want you to imagine that, uh, you imagine a kind of work situation. So, so, so you're in work and you've been asked to give a short talk to people at work on, on health and safety. And um, it's quite a big deal for you. And so you've been kind of preparing what you're going to say and you've got some notes. And the day when you're going to give the talk, you're kind of walking into work and, and you kind of got your notes out because you're kind of rehearsing all this and you're reading your notes. And that's when you walked into the lamppost. <laughs> and um, afterwards, you're kind of reflecting. You were sort of doing the right thing. You, know, you were concerned about health and safety, and you, were, uh, and you were sort of reading up about all this. But somehow, you missed the main point. And um, I think you know, that, that, that is, a, is a big thing that can happen. It can happen to Christians as well as you. you know, we become focused on our performance. You know, it's about me and how I'm doing with God and very much about me, and I'm missing the big point, which is actually all about Jesus. Yeah. Um, and, and that's really what, uh, to a large extent, the, the Jews were, were getting wrong. Next, uh, next one. And um, there's a clear either-or about this. Like, this is quotations from uh, Isaiah that Paul has brought together. He says, you know, Jesus is either a stone that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. Or it's the case that anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. And there is that kind of sharp either-or thing in relation to Jesus. And as you can see that played out in the Gospels, you know, that um, in all that Jesus was, was doing and saying, his miracles and his teaching, 
some people are being drawn towards it and are saying, actually, I, I, I kind of want this. And some people are increasingly rejecting him. So, you know, by the end of his life, the Jewish establishment, who, by the way, are, are deeply divided about anything else. Some of them are a kind of religious fundamentalist, hardliners. Some of them are deep liberals who don't even believe in an afterlife. You know, they've got very little faith at all. And some of them are politicians, kind of judging the politics of the day. But that Jewish establishment had pretty much decided they would be better off with Jesus completely out of the way. But other people even though their faith was wobbly and their behaviors were often wobbly too, were kind of looking to Jesus to be the answer for them. And, and that still, it's an acute thing. I think, you know, Jesus is the dividing line. You know, all this stuff about you and God, it boils down to, to where are you with Jesus? That's what it boils down to. Are you, are you for Jesus? Are you being drawn towards him? Are you looking for more of Jesus in your life? Or are you, are you pushing him away? And you might say, well, that, that sounds a bit, a, a bit too black and white, Chris, because you know, surely there are many people who are, who are not Christians, who never become Christians, who have nice things to say about Jesus. That, that is true, by the way. Um, only I would say, of course, is, the Jesus they have nice things to say about is not the Jesus of the Bible, not the whole Jesus of the Bible. It's the bits of Jesus in the Bible they happen to agree with. You know, fundamentally, the test is going to be the same one that Thomas felt. Um, that, that, that Thomas said at the end, he said, after he touched the risen Jesus, he said, my Lord and my God. Are we prepared to say, my Lord and my God, to Jesus? Or are we not? It's one or the other. And that is, that is the choice that faces us individually and all of mankind. Next slide. The longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for X to be saved. Well, it's clear that um, in the passage, the X is the Jewish people. But I want to ask, who is your X? Who is the person, the people, for you can say that the longing of your heart and your prayer to God is for them to be saved. Let's pray. Father, the truth is not always easy. But Lord, we'd rather, be, we'd have, we'd rather have the truth and still have questions than live with something that isn't true. And Lord, we are praying that the response of our heart to Jesus Christ would be to embrace him as Lord and Savior. Forgive us for the times, Lord, when we made our lives about us, even if it's about our performance of, of being a Christian. Lord, strip away the things that stop us making our lives all about Jesus. Lord, bring us back to you and to you alone. Risen, ascended, Lord, bring us to you. And Lord, we do pray from the depth of our spirit for those who are precious to us. Lord, save them. Amen. Amen.